Well, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, we're gonna make this kind of a fun and easy evening program. I've got a, a lot of information to share with you, but um, you know, I, I don't think you necessarily have to take notes on everything, but um, just kind of enjoy some of the ideas and opportunities that could be available for specialty crop production. Um, and we'll just go ahead and get started here. So um, as Scott mentioned, I am the director of the Olathe Horticulture Center. Oh, let me see. I guess it's not too loud. Um, so I just wanted to show a couple of videos of that since we're not able to see each other in person these days. Um, this is just some drone footage we got this past summer. We do a lot of research with high tunnel production in particular. So these are basically unheated uh, structures that look like greenhouses, but um, from an engineering standpoint, they're, they're not quite the same. Um, and from a production standpoint, we typically are gonna grow in the soil as opposed to on benches or in hydroponic systems like you would in a typical greenhouse. Uh, so you can see there's the master gardener area just sort of in the bottom part of the screen and then some more shots of our research area. Uh, the research station is about 350 acres in total, uh, but we really tightly manage probably about 80 acres or so for horticulture production. Uh, this year, because of, well, I should say in 2020, because of COVID-19, we shut down to what we call limited operations. So <clears throat> we didn't use all of the production space that we have, um, but <clears throat> we still had a number of trials uh, in our high tunnels, uh, including work with strawberries and tomatoes, peppers, uh, we're also playing around a little bit with industrial hemp uh, and CBD hemp. So I just sort of wanted to show some of that so you could get a, a feel for what it looks like uh, if you ever come out to the research station. Um, and again, for any of you home gardeners out there, the Backyard Master Gardeners uh, demonstration garden is really cool. You can see as we just finished on there. <coughs> Whoops, I don't know why it's doing that. I lost my tracker. There we go. Uh, the other thing that I just want to direct your attention towards is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the Kansas Specialty Crop Growers Association. Uh, so this originally started as the Kansas Vegetable Growers Association, and the association has actually been around for a long time. But in the last uh, two to three years, I would say, um, the, the association is rebranded into what we call the Kansas Specialty Crop Growers Association. So that includes fruits and vegetables cut flower growers, greenhouse growers, pretty much anybody that's going to be bringing products to a farmer's market or a restaurant or a grocery store fits within um, the, the definition of the association. So if you have an interest in getting into specialty crop production or, or growing produce, in other words, um, you might look into getting to be a part of the association. Um, and we do have scholarships available. Well, actually, I'm sorry, we just ran out, but um, Memberships are a very nominal fee of $10 per year. Uh, there's a, a private Facebook group, which a lot of people find really useful. So you can communicate with other growers in the area, find out what other people are doing. Um, and then there's an online directory. So customers, other people can find you as well too, uh, if they're out looking for produce. Uh, the other thing that I just wanted to mention as well as a resource is the Growing Growers Program. And so that's basically an apprenticeship uh, program that we run here in Kansas City. And there's also now a chapter in the Wichita area called Growing Growers ICT. Um, and what we do there is we do host, we help locate apprentices onto commercial farms. Um, now we're, we're basically done taking apprenticeship applications for the 2021 growing season. But one of the things that we've done, um, especially with the advent of COVID-19 is we turned all of our workshop series online. And so this summer um, we'll have about a dozen workshops that we're gonna do uh, online. And so if you're interested in growing fruits and vegetables, I really recommend you check into those uh, and you can just uh, find out more information on the website about that. <clears throat> so we're basically here to talk about opportunities in specialty crop production or growing fruits and vegetables. And you know, one of the things that I think is important that probably is one of the reasons you all might be interested in this topic is, you know, to first of all, just recognize that there is a lot of opportunity right now in the world of local agriculture. And it's one of the reasons why I stay very busy uh, as, as Scott can attest, there's just all kinds of things happening in the state and the region. 
um, and elsewhere related to growing fruits and vegetables locally. Uh, and part of that is the expansion of all these different types of markets like farmers markets, CSAs, farm to school and restaurants. Um, but it's also because people are, you know, really wanting to support local, local agriculture. Uh, and we led a project in 2015 with uh, Kansas City Healthy Kids uh, and did a buyer survey and basically found that there's about $177 million in unmet demand in the Kansas City area alone. So, you know, for anybody that can get produce to Kansas City or Wichita, there's a huge demand uh, for local products. The other thing uh, that's more recent news is just, you know, everything that's happened related to the pandemic. And I actually pulled these numbers. This was on the news the other day. There was just a, a study published uh, about how people have been, uh, quote unquote, discovering vegetables uh, during the, the shutdown and the pandemic. And I, you know, I'm sure lots of us could speculate different reasons as to why that could be happening. Um, but, you know, I thought it was interesting that 52% of people now consider themselves vegetable fanatics. Uh, so, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean they're local vegetable fanatics, but I think that, you know, you're just going to see that market continue to grow and grow and grow. No pun intended there. Uh, the other thing that I think, you know, we do a lot of work uh, here in the Kansas City region with beginning farmers and people that are interested in getting into farming. And one of the things I always like to do uh, is to just reiterate what farming is. Um, and, you know, there's obviously it's a lot of hard work. And if, if you're not interested in working hard, then you probably don't want to try growing fruits and vegetables because that is definitely a big part of it. Um, but I had a, a buddy when I was in North Carolina when I was in graduate school uh, that, that you can see his quote here. Um, and, and I thought there was a lot of you know, truth in that if there is such a thing. Um, and, and I don't wanna try and sway anybody's philosophy one way or another, but one of the things to keep in mind is that if you're gonna get into small scale agriculture and local agriculture is that you need to recognize it as a business and that it needs to be profitable and sustainable. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of perceptions amongst the public about, you know, this small scale fam family farm where they're, you know, maybe using horses to like work the fields or something like that. And, and, and maybe some of that does go on still, but, um, and, and maybe it's okay if consumers still have that perception a little bit, if it, if it helps them bring their dollars to local markets. Uh, but if you really want to be successful at it, you need to recognize the business part of it. Um, and how important that is, and also be willing to take advantage of new technologies, things like high tunnels you can see in this picture here, um, and other things so that you can really increase your productivity. So when thinking about some of the different opportunities and specialty crops, you know, I think, you know, just like starting any other business, the, the first thing you want to think about is what resources do you have that you can leverage uh, in order to be successful. So you know, obviously uh, we think about the, the farm and the land, um, but also things like labor and, um, you know, how many people do you have to help manage these crops? Um, do you have access to, you know, labor that you can afford or, you know, for a lot of people that's their family, right? And, and so, you know, those kinds of things are important. Um, also, do you have access to a market? Um, and, and have you thought about what that market's gonna be where those products are gonna go and who's gonna be paying for them because in order for it to be sustainable, it has to be a sustainable business first. Um, and then thinking about your goals. And this is one of the things that I, I really enjoy my job because I get to work with a lot of growers out there and not all growers have the same goals. Some people wanna be super profitable and you know, be able to support a couple of families and still be able to go on vacations and do things like that. And, and others, you know, maybe they're, they're early retirees and they're just looking for a little bit of cash to, to bring in so that they can make it a little bit easier to go to the grocery store and stuff like that to, to pay the bills. And so, you know, thinking about your goals, um, whether it's financial or lifestyle or quality of life are really important whenever you're, you're trying to take some of these opportunities. Because if your goals are not necessarily um, to, you know, bring in a lot of cash or, or, or vice versa, you know, then, then you may take a different approach. <clears throat> um, now, this is a slide I pulled off of uh, a different uh, presentation I have about farm in infrastructure, but it's 
it's always good to think about what resources you have in terms of those basic infrastructure needs for a market farm. So, uh, you know, soil is, is obvious um, and, and understanding challenges and advantages to the soils on your land are, are very important. Um, but water, water is also a big one. And a lot of folks don't think about this when they, they first get into market farming. Um, having a quality source of water uh, becomes very important. And I'll talk about some of the reasons why, um, but you want to make sure you think about that uh, before you just start trying to go into the business of growing produce. Uh, what are some of the challenges in Kansas? Well, we have a lot. This is one of the reasons that Kansas, Kansans are some of the, the toughest folks out there. Um, and, you know, it, it also means that we have to be tough to be able to grow vegetables. Uh, I think everybody's familiar with our extreme weather conditions. Uh, as an example of that, we had a 70 degree swing in the high temperatures here a few days uh, in seven days uh, last week. And I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, but, you know, the other thing that can be kind of challenging here in Kansas is there's just not a lot of history of vegetable production in the last 50 years. And so as a result of that, there's not a lot of infrastructure out there in terms of, you know, in, in some states, you can just go to a terminal market and sell giant truckloads of tomatoes or melons or something like that, whereas that those things don't really exist here in Kansas. Um, and similarly, it's hard to find uh, equipment, you know, if you're looking for used equipment and, and stuff like that for production, uh, that can be a challenge because there's just not a lot of those things laying around uh, here in the state. So, you know, those can be a little bit challenging uh, when trying to start a farm. And now there are a lot of opportunities here in Kansas. Uh, one is, again, this wide open market. And, you know, I think a lot of folks that grow vegetables in Kansas don't, don't recognize um, you know, quite frankly, how little competition there is. If you go to many other states on the East and West Coast, go to a farmer's market, you know, it's packed with vendors. Whereas oftentimes that's not necessarily the case uh, in this part of the country. And, you know, you can see that analogy across all the different markets, whether it's wholesale, restaurant, so on and so forth. There's still lots of room to grow uh, for, for local production here in the area. Uh, the other thing that I think a lot of folks don't recognize as a, an opportunity here is we do have land and we have good soils, generally speaking, uh, in this part of the country. Prairie soils are, you know, fairly high in organic matter um, and, and typically respond well um, to amendments and things like that. And so, you know, it's good to, to not forget we have that resource. Uh, this is just a little map I made when I was giving a similar presentation down in southwest Kansas, but I think the same principle applies here. So uh, in, in this particular case, I was giving, uh, this is based out of liberal Kansas, um, not Newton, uh, but this, this circle basically represents uh, an eight-hour drive uh, for <laughs> delivery. So, you know, I, I worked a little bit with the Pennsylvania Vegetable Growers Association there, and one of the things they sort of boast is that from the center of Pennsylvania, within a, you're within a day's drive of about 33% of the population in the United States, which is a pretty staggering statistic in itself. Um, and we certainly don't have that kind of market share uh, here in Kansas, but within a day's drive, there are quite a few pretty large towns and cities um, that represent you know, very available markets uh, for you know, anybody that's trying to scale up to that wholesale production. So what are some of the things we want to think about when growing specialty crops? And this is sort of what we're going to be talking about for the next few minutes. Um, you know, there's a lot of considerations. And one of the challenges and things that can be somewhat overwhelming about getting into this, this world um, is, is that, you know, as opposed to corn and soybeans and wheat, you know, there's a hundred different crops you can grow, right? And there's 20 different types of markets that you can sell to, and there's a hundred different ways to grow any of those crops. And so it can, it can feel overwhelming at times. Um, and so, you know, I think one thing that's important to not forget in all of this is that you should be, you know, doing something that you want to do. And if, if uh, growing the, the best apples in South Central Kansas is something you're really dedicated to doing, then you know, maybe you should work on that and, and see how that goes. 
I get a lot of questions also about the organic program and what exactly that means if you're getting into starting your own farm. So I'm sure most of us are all familiar with, with the USDA organic program. Uh, the organic program is certified by uh, the NOP, the National Organic Program. Um, and essentially what this is going to mean is that uh, you are going to have to pay a certification, an annual certification fee. And we do have certified organic areas in parts of our research station. Some of those high tunnels you saw at the beginning are certified organic. So we pay about a $500 a year uh, certification fee. Um, and that basically pays for the inspector to come once a year and, and check and make sure everything's on up and up. Um, and then we have to do a lot of documentation in terms of what the inputs are and making sure that all the fertilizers and pesticides that we use in those areas uh, are approved by the National Organic Program. So, <clears throat> You know, we can talk uh, more later about some of the details of how all that works, but, you know, in general, it's going to be a bit of paperwork um, and it is going to be managing those crops differently, uh, which comes with its own challenges and benefits as well. So we've mentioned markets already a couple of times, and, you know, I think one of the, the, the first things you want to think about if you're going to start a specialty crop farm uh, is how you want to market your products because there's, you know, uh, only a few different ways to grow a tomato in Kansas, um, but there's lots of different ways to sell it and lots of different, um, you know, markets to sell it to in terms of different people out there and who you want to reach. And so, you know, thinking about where your farm is, uh, how it's oriented, uh, and how your market's going to work becomes really important. Are you going to take those products to uh, to the market, like in the case of a farmer's market, or if you're delivering to restaurants or grocery stores? <clears throat> are you going to have people come to the farm and pick products up? Um, and in this case, there's a picture of a CSA pickup, but CSAs can also be delivered as well, too. So, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can sell those goods. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with CSA. CSAs are what we call, it's short for Community Supported Agriculture. And a CSA share is essentially a subscription uh, to vegetables from a, a particular farmer. So, uh, so I've had CSAs in the past where I would basically pay a farmer in, in February or March, uh, get signed up for that CSA, and then they're going to provide me with a weekly box of vegetables. And the different types of vegetables are going to change over the course of the year based on seasonality and what they have and what they have available. Now, since CSA sort of started a decade or two ago, they've really changed and there's all different types of flavors of CSAs. Some CSAs provide you with more flexibility. Some CSAs are communal between multiple farms. So you can get, for example, like meat and eggs and dairy and in addition to your vegetables and fruit. Um, so there's lots of different variations on the theme there, but the idea is basically it's like a subscription service that you typically pay for ahead of time. And one of the things that's nice about CSAs for growers is that it provides you with a, a you know, fairly steady um, and significant influx of cash in the spring. And so for a lot of growers, it allows them to um, you know, have some cash that they can pay for, you know, all the labor it takes to manage the crops during the year. And then, you know, it, it depends really on, <clears throat> excuse me, the market. But I've also seen a lot of growers that, you know, utilize CSAs as a way to offload some of their products that aren't necessarily um, uh, marketable enough for grocery stores and some of the wholesale markets that are really particular about size, shape, and quality. Uh, you know, if they get a tomato with a funny little bumpy end on it, most CSA people don't really mind, whereas the restaurants do. So, you know, it gives you the ability to get rid of some of those number twos, um, but still get value for them. I'm sure most folks are familiar with you, you pick operations, um, but you know, you pick uh, farms always fascinate me a lot. I, I think there's a lot of cool things that happen at you pick farms, both in terms of, you know, being very useful for the grower, but also as a, a way to educate the public about where their food comes from. And, you know, probably many of us uh, know that many consumers out there really don't understand that a strawberry comes 
from this plant that's uh, in, in front of this picture here. And so it, it gives the public an opportunity to learn more about uh, agriculture and horticulture and, and where their food comes from. So I'm a big fan of UPIC operations. One of the things that I think, depending on what you're growing, um, can be really useful with UPIC operations is, is it allows you to outsource some of your labor needs. So strawberry is a great example of that. Um, strawberries uh, take a lot of labor to harvest them and it's and it's fairly intensive uh, and if you have any sizable field this is you know a couple acres of strawberries here it's going to take a lot of people to harvest all those um, and there are people out there that will pick for sale um, but the you pick operations are great for strawberries because it just uh, it, it allows you to outsource that labor so um, these folks, Jerry and Jane Wallets, who own this farm just outside of Lawrence, they're basically a small family that run the farm. And during the harvest season, they have to hire a crew to help manage the crowds. Um, but other than that, they basically run that farm on their own, just, you know, two or three or four of them within the family in terms of managing the day-to-day -day labor and watering and pesticide application and that kind of stuff. <clears throat> Uh, weeding is a big part of life on the farm. So, you know, and, and, and labor in general. And, and the reason I put this slide in there is, you know, I think depending on the size and the scale of a farm that you want to start, you should be thinking about where you're going to be getting your labor from. Um, is it through high school students in the, in the area? Is it through, an, you know, an apprenticeship program or an internship program? And there are a lot of uh, very active programs out there in Kansas and across the country that help support uh, beginning farmers? Um, or is it gonna be through through other sources? Or, you know, I've also seen, we have a, a farm here in the area that actually has 150 member CSA. And part of becoming a CSA member of that farm is they have to put 20 hours of volunteer time at the farm. So they actually have work days where they get consumers out there um, to actually help with the farm. And that's a, you know, another cool thing um, not only because it's useful for the growers to get a little bit of free labor, but it also helps connect those consumers uh, with where their foods comes from, and so they, they value it more. Uh, if you're going to get into fruit and vegetable production, one of the things you might want to learn a little bit about is uh, the use of plastic culture. And, you know, this can be sometimes a, a controversial topic because obviously plastic is a uh, a waste product that, that goes into the landfill, but it is something that's, that's used a lot in fruit and vegetable production of any, you know, sizable commercial scale. Um, so you can see this is basically a tractor mounted piece of equipment that makes a raised bed, lays down that plastic mulch, and also puts a drip tape underneath it at the same time. And what that does is it provides a lot of advantages for production, um, in particular, weed management, um, just trying to have clean plants is going to be really important, especially when it comes to, to harvest season. Um, but it also helps warm the soil, it helps conserve soil moisture, um, and, and helps conserve water. And so plastic culture systems are extraordinarily popular in, in commercial fruit and vegetable production. Now, there are certain crops that aren't grown on plastic, um, but uh, you know, in general, it's a fairly widely used uh, system. I just wanted to show a couple pictures. So this is this is actually over at Jerry and Jane's place in Lawrence, and they're growing uh, broccoli here on plastic. Um, that you can see, and then and then they've got lettuce here. They actually plant um, annual ryegrass in between the plastic rows, is basically like a living mulch, um, but. You can imagine 20 years ago, people were growing this much broccoli, they would be using a pretty large amount of herbicides in order to keep a clean enough field so that the, those plants would be successful. And, and now people are, are typically using plastic uh, instead of herbicides or sometimes in combination with them when you have really severe pressure. Uh, water needs are a big topic whenever thinking about starting a farm. Um, and again, we won't go into too much detail. This is something we could talk about for, for a very long time. Um, but thinking about the, the source of the water is going to become really important. So uh, if you have surface water, if you have a pond on your property that you want to use for irrigation, um, we actually pump out of Spoon Creek at the research station, which is probably the worst uh, source of water because it's very dirty. 
Um, and it's problematic in terms of giant trees coming down the creek that we got to, you know, fix when the storms come and things like that. Um, I, ideally, in a perfect real world, if you have access to a well with high quality water, um, that is definitely your, your best situation uh, for growing fruits and vegetables because you're going to need a fair bit of water, um, not only for production, um, but also for um, doing post-harvest washing and things like that. Now, um, some people will grow, in, especially in sort of urban farms or peri-urban farms with uh, city water or rural water, and that can be done. Um, and there's, you know, there's lots of farms out there that are doing that, um, but it can get expensive during certain years. And one of the things too that can be more challenging is that oftentimes your, your residential service line is gonna be a three quarter inch line. And so you're, you're just not going to be able to water that much stuff at one time. And that can become uh, problematic, again, depending on, on how much space you're trying to irrigate. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, packing and washing and all the post-harvest side of fruits and vegetables um, is really important. We could talk about that for an entire evening. But, um, you know, I did just want to mention that uh, as a because, first of all, you're going to need it as a source of water. And, and also, it won't take very long um, before you just need that as a sort of a piece of equipment uh, on the farm. And it's one of the things that a lot of folks get into farming that don't think about it ahead of time is like, are you going to have a space that's cleanable uh, that you can use to, you know, manage all these products? Uh, in this in this picture, somebody has actually basically repurposed a high tunnel or greenhouse into a packing shed. So, you know, this doesn't mean it has to be a Taj Mahal or anything like that, but it does need to be covered so that uh, birds and other wildlife, um, you know, can't make a mess of it. Um, this, this is a farm up in Iowa, and this is definitely a, a bit more advanced packing shed, but, you know, as you scale up, um, these, these packing houses be, do become, you know, pretty sophisticated. Um, and can get quite expensive. And we won't go into all the details of that. I think most people are probably interested in more small scale uh, production. I did wanna mention a, uh, just a, a couple minutes though about cooling, because this is something that you'll wanna think about if you get into small scale agriculture. Um, it doesn't take long before you need your own cooler uh, for those products. And for really small scale growers, you know, maybe that's a reach-in cooler that you buy from an old restaurant or a, or a cut flower shop. Um, but then for, you know, for most folks, you're going to need something that you can, you know, store a fair bit of uh, produce in because the, the, the better you can control the temperature of the produce after it's picked, the longer it's going to last and, and the less likely it is that it's going to spoil. And there's been a lot of research done in that world that, that basically shows um, you know, the best thing you can do to prevent spoilage is really focus on uh, temperature management. Now, the general rule of thumb from the post-harvest folks is that you want to have as much storage space as you need for an entire day's uh, market or harvest, depending on which way you want to look at it. We actually uh, built this kind of cool thing down here in the bottom right hand corner. This is a mobile cooler. And these have become uh, pretty popular in the last five or so years where you can actually just heavily insulate a trailer um, and then use what these things we call cool bot systems that, that basically utilize um, window air conditioning units and, and they basically overclock the thermostat so you can crank it down to 40 degrees or 45 degrees uh, for produce. Uh, and so they work pretty nicely. And the nice And the good thing about that mobile cooler is you can take it down to the field and pack right into it. You can take it to the market. Um, and even if it's not powered when you're on the road, um, the idea is you could basically put a generator in the back of a truck and, and run the, the cooling unit. But even if you don't do that, we found with the one we have that once you get it, once you get everything cool inside of there, it will stay cool in there for a very long time. So you can take this to market and keep all your stuff fresh. This would be what you think of as sort of like a, a walk-in cooler that would be inside of a packing shed. Um, and, you know, there's lots of opportunities to get these at old restaurants and grocery stores. Um, and then oftentimes people will 
re-outfit them with one of those Coolbot units because they're fairly inexpensive. Uh, the last thing I kind of just wanted to mention related to that was just to, to make sure you're aware of the Food Safety Modernization Act. So FISMA is a relatively new thing in the produce world, um, but it's, you know, basically is a regulation of food safety for fresh produce. And believe it or not, prior to, you know, about 2015, uh, there was no regulation on fresh produce um, and how that works. Whereas with, you know, dairy and meat, there's obviously the USDA and the health code folks have been involved from for a very long time. That just hasn't been the case with produce. And so the FISMA basically changed that and it's put regulation into the hands of the FDA. Now, one of the things that's, that's important to keep in mind with this is there's a, it's a tiered system. And so um, there's, you're, you can be exempt from FISMA uh, if you're growing less than $25,000 worth of produce per year. So this is not gonna be something that's gonna be a problem if you're just getting into a small scale sort of hobby farm. Um, but once you're selling more than $250,000 per year, uh, then you need a fairly you know, tightly regulated food safety plan. You do have to go do some training, um, but it's all very doable stuff, but just wanted to make sure that you're, you're aware of that. So, you know, the big question is, what are you going to grow if you want to start this farm? So, um, you know, I just thought I would sort of zip through some of the crops that I think can be particularly useful in a, a place like central Kansas, um, you know, especially knowing, you know, what you have to do to get those things to market. So we mentioned strawberries already uh, once. Now, these strawberries are grown in plastic culture systems. So again, that raised bed with the black plastic is, is gonna be typical. This is different than the way we think of strawberries being, being grown historically. Um, strawberries have been grown as a perennial in the past, um, but in this system, we're actually growing them as an annual. Um, so this is sort of the, the annual strawberry production system. And, and Scott mentioned to me that um, Rebecca McMahon talked to y'all about fruit last uh, week or last month, whenever the last, um, webinar was, so I hope this isn't redundant, um, but in the annual strawberry system, essentially you're gonna plant those things in about the 1st of September uh, up to the 15th or 20th or so. They're gonna grow for a while, and then we actually put row cover over across the entire field um, for the winter time, and then harvest them usually around Memorial Day is when they start to come on through the middle of June. And then we'll actually destroy that crop and plant a cover crop or rotate to another field. Uh, you can see some of the equipment that's used for removing the plastic, et cetera, but it is an annual system. So in that case, you're not growing them as a perennial. Uh, asparagus is a crop that grows really well in Kansas. And, and <clears throat> one of the nice things about asparagus is if you get a productive patch going for, um, they can be very productive for a, a very long time with you know, relatively little maintenance. And we have a, a UPIC asparagus farm just outside of Lawrence. It has about 20 acres of asparagus and they do really well. They bring people in from all over the region to, to pick asparagus. And, you know, it's one of those crops that, again, once you get it established, I wouldn't say that it, there's no work involved, but um, it's fairly minimal. This is uh, our little asparagus patch out at the research station. Um, there's a number of varieties that do fairly well here in Kansas. The, the UC lines all do, do pretty good. And then Purple Passion is one that's kind of fun. And of course, being a K-State person, we always like to try and promote purple things. Um, but, but again, asparagus really likes our fertile soils. And the nice thing about asparagus is during the really hot, droughty part of the year that's just kind of miserable for most plants in Kansas, they're more or less dormant and not really doing much. So they're going to be really active in the spring. Um, we'll actually start seeing asparagus shoots coming up around St. Patrick's Day, the middle of March. And <clears throat> depending on your harvesting practices, you can harvest those more or less through the end of May. Uh, Irish potatoes do really well here in Kansas, especially if you have uh, sandy soils. Um, Irish potatoes, you know, again, especially you get a little bit further south and south central in Kansas, it's just warm enough as compared to here um, that you can get a little bit of 
season extension and, and, and get good potatoes in the spring before it gets too hot. Um, there's lots of different ways to grow potatoes here in the state. And I would definitely recommend you get with Scott and other folks in the area uh, to help give recommendations on those. Um, but again, they really like sandy soils. And so that's something to look for. <clears throat> uh, cucurbits in general love the state of Kansas. Um, and so when we talk about cucurbits, we're talking about melons, cantaloupe, cucumbers, squash, and pumpkins. And, and one of the reasons why they love this state is because they really like warm weather and they have very deep rooted systems. And so when it gets hot and, and droughty in the summer, they don't mind it, you know, at all. Um, and we've grown lots of different things. These are some no-till watermelons here with, um, with fabric mulch. This is a picture from the research station. Um, this is a picture I took out at, um, in Cortland, Kansas at um, Dan Coon's farm, Dan and Kathy Coon. Uh, they're called the Depot Market. Uh, they're one of the largest cucurbit grower, probably the largest cucurbit grower in the state of Kansas. Uh, and they, they'll do uh, 50 acres of squash and um, other mixed cucurbits, and then they'll do about 100 acres of pumpkins that they ship all over the region. Um, and, and they've been very successful with that. Uh, this They actually use center pivot irrigation systems, so you can't really tell from this picture. There's a center pivot way back there, um, but uh, these this is in plastic, but they're actually not on drip. They, they do run center pivot across the plastic, which I... Um, was a little skeptical when I first learned about it, but it, it works really pretty well for them. <clears throat> uh, this is a picture I took in Atchison, Kansas. These are some cantaloupes uh, out of Joe Schwinn's farm, and you can see he's using a lot of cover crops too, which is always a good practice to help build soil health um, and can be really useful. He's up on the top of a big hill uh, up there near Atchison, up, up, up there and, um, you know, those cover crops help provide some windbreak uh, for those plants early in the season. And, and one of the things he was talking to me about when I was there that particular day was, you know, you can see how windswept these fields get um, and how that soil has been blowing around. And so, you know, providing some protection can be really useful for that. Um, winter squash and summer squash are, are all things that do, you know, very well here in the state. Now, one of the things you're always going to want to be careful about with the cucurbits as a whole, and especially squash and pumpkins, um, are squash bugs and cucumber beetles. And I will tell you that it is extraordinarily difficult to grow organic uh, winter squash, um, but there are folks that are successful at it uh, here in the state. But, the, you know, by and large, most of the folks that are growing those crops are going to be doing it with conventional pesticides. Uh, pumpkins are another really great crop here in the area, um, and they can be really nice for agritourism uh, facilities and, and, you know, you pick farms and things like that. And there's a whole bunch of really cool decorative pumpkins out there, um, as well as edibles, but it, especially all these cool, like, bubbly and gnarly, you know, funky looking pumpkins. Um, and the growers that I work with, you know, really find those to be highly marketable. They help bring people into their stand. Uh, bring people to their farm, wherever it is that they're, they're trying to sell. Uh, so this is a buddy of mine down in Fort Scott, Ron Brown's farm, and he grows a lot of pumpkins that he will take to farmer's market. Um, his is not an agritourism facility, but, you know, you can see some of these big, beautiful pumpkins that they grow out there. Um, and in this case, he's not using plastic culture. This is all bare ground systems. Um, now, there are folks that use plastic culture for pumpkins or, or other systems as well, too. Um, but again, this is a crop that does really well in the area. Um, and, you know, the nice thing about pumpkins as opposed to tomatoes, which you have to go out and harvest every week and really high labor, um, pumpkins, if you can just keep the weeds down for the first six weeks or so, they'll pretty much take care of themselves, um, you know, other than spraying and until you have to harvest them. So, you know, being able to think about the, the labor needs of the different crops is going to be important because you cannot um, afford to go out there and just harvest tomatoes all day, every day through the whole summer, right? Uh, we did quite a bit of work with no-till pumpkins, and this is a project that we wrapped up three or, well, four or five years ago, um, where you would actually grow cover crops. So in this particular 
particular picture, this is probably um, annual rye, cereal rye, essentially, um, that we would plant in the fall. And then we use this thing called a roller crimper to roll it down and plant those pumpkins through the residue. And so that's, that's a nice technique um, because it helps uh, improve soil health and, you know, helps manage, you know, some of the compaction and some of those issues. But it's particularly useful for pumpkins and melons because you have this nice clean surface to grow those pumpkins on. Um, you know, similar to home gardeners spreading straw mulch, it gives you the ability to do that in a, at a very large scale. Um, now that being said, it, no-till pumpkins comes with its challenges and if you're interested in, in trying that out and you haven't grown pumpkins before, uh, be sure to give us a call because we can give you some advice on that. So this is a picture of that roller crimper um, and they make these much larger. Ours is an eight foot wide one that we use to roll down cover crops, um, but there are ones that, that get huge. Some of them will actually run on the front of the tractor. And so like I, I have a buddy in Pennsylvania who when they, when they plant pumpkins, they actually are rolling down the cover crop in the front and planting in the back. And so in a single pass, they can actually roll it and plant it at the same time. <clears throat> this is just a picture of one of our research trials. So again, you can see, um, you know, pumpkins just love our heat. They love our, our droughty weather that we get. Uh, and this is actually not too far from y'all um, in Hayesville, Kansas, just south of Wichita. Uh, this is a pumpkin grower. Well, th he, these folks grow all kinds of different things. Um, and they have a UPIC strawberry patch. And in this case, you can't tell from the picture, um, but they're actually growing pumpkins on the same plastic that they were growing their strawberries. So they'll essentially harvest their strawberries until you know, June 1st, June 10th. Um, and then they'll, in this case, this is a conventional farm. So they'll go through with glyphosate or something else to actually burn down the strawberries and kill them. And then they'll just plant pumpkins right behind them uh, in that plastic. And so you get two crops from, a, from that plastic bed, which can be really useful. Uh, sweet potatoes are a great crop in Kansas. Um, and actually, sweet potatoes historically have, um, excuse me, a lot of history grown in this part of the country, especially in areas with sandier soil. Um, now, sweet potatoes are a little bit they're, they're really grown in a different way than Irish potatoes. Uh, and we grow them from what we call slips. And so these will be planted somewhere around uh, middle of June, uh, depending on what part of the state you're in. Uh, this is down in Hayesville at the research station there. You can see that this is a sweet potato field. So, you know, basically you would let those grow until usually about October 1st. Um, and then you would harvest them. Uh, these are some sweet potatoes we grew at the research station. We played around a little bit with growing them on plastic. That didn't work great. Uh, they get a little bit melted from the plastic. It gets kind of hot. Uh, but we also did some cool stuff with stale seed bedding over here where we would actually put the plastic on, let it sit for two to three weeks, and then take it off before we planted. Um, and that was actually pretty effective. I've got a video here. Let's see if it's going to work. This is the sweet potato digger down in Hayesville. Sorry, that's kind of loud. So this is a this is a, a digger that actually goes through the field um, and will harvest those sweet potatoes uh, in October after after they've sized up. And you can basically see it's essentially just a big shovel <laughs> that digs into those rows, and then they're going to pop out through that conveyor belt. Uh, onions are another thing that, that really grows well in, in central Kansas. They also like sandy soils um, and they also, you know, do really well with, with some of those long falls and early springs that y'all get down that way. Uh, and garlic as well too, which is a relative of onion. Uh, onions can be grown on plastic. Uh, this is at Jerry and Jane's farm. Um, and you can see, you know, and they grow some really nice onions uh, on those plastic mulch beds. Uh, sweet corn, I think most folks are familiar with that. Um, you know, sweet corn is going to be pretty aggressive. And, and what's nice about growing something like sweet corn is 
you know, you can find equipment out there to help you plant that, uh, which can be really useful. Um, this was some no-till sweet corn that we grew uh, out at the research station. There is uh, Roundup Ready sweet corn now available if you're if you're interested in, in going that route. Um, and, you know, it, it can be pretty useful, especially if you're trying to grow in a no-till system. Uh, I get a lot of questions about greenhouse production, and there's a lot of people, I think, out there that are interested in in growing in greenhouses and, and you know, there's a lot of information out there on the web. Um, uh, there are a number of, of folks that are successful with greenhouse production in the region. Uh, one of the, you know, quite frankly, easiest crops to grow, well, I shouldn't say easy, but it, but it doesn't require as much equipment and things like that, uh, is microgreens. And there's a lot of folks here in the Kansas City region that have found microgreens to be a, a very successful and profitable crop. So essentially you're growing things like cabbage, things like arugula, things like sprouts, essentially in these trays. And then you just cut them as small shoots and then those get used in salads. They use, they're used as garnishes, they're used in soups. A lot of higher end restaurants are big into microgreens. <clears throat> now, obviously that's a, a niche market, so it does get saturated. Uh, here you can see some hydroponic uh, basil being grown. This is in, in St. John. Um, Spencer Rain's one of my favorite farmers in Kansas, and I don't know if he's still growing uh, down there in Wichita or not. I, I need to check in with Spencer and see how he's doing. Uh, but he's been growing hydroponic tomatoes uh, down there uh, very successfully and, and cucumbers as well. Um, and Scott asked me to touch on uh, high tunnels a little bit. I know we're getting short on time, so I'm just going to show you some pictures and kind of blast through this stuff. Uh, pretty quickly, um, but just to, to, you know, sort of make you aware of, of uh, this ability of, of high tunnels to increase productivity. And, you know, they're really useful in Kansas where we have a lot of wind and a lot of storms and, you know, just crazy weather. Um, it's amazing what a little piece of plastic will do to help protect those crops. So again, this is a picture from our research station. These are our certified organic high tunnels. Um, and you can, you know, not you can, you can purchase kits, uh, high tunnel kits. You can also make homemade high tunnels. Um, and if you weren't aware, uh, the NRCS also has an EQIP program that will help do a cost share. So they'll actually um, provide some funding to help you put up a high tunnel. Uh, we do run a website called hightunnels.org. And so if you're interested in high tunnel production, I would, I would definitely direct you towards that site. There's all kinds of great resources there. Um, and, you know, there's lots of different reasons why people are growing in high tunnels. Uh, we talk a lot about season extension and the ability to plant earlier and harvest later. Um, but again, in Kansas, one of the, the, the really useful things about growing in tunnels is just the ability to protect those crops from the great state of Kansas, because it's just kind of brutal as a growing environment. Uh, this is one of my good buddies in Bueller, Kansas, uh, and some of you all may know him. He's pretty close to your all's neighborhood. Uh, Randy Clark's been growing in high tunnels there for quite a long time. Uh, and you can see this is a picture I took probably back in 2012 or 2013. Uh, there's some great resources out there, and I just want to draw your attention towards this um, Growing Undercover, which is a, a production guide that there's actually been two volumes put out about high tunnels. Uh, through the Kansas Rural Center, and I and I helped put those publications together as well, too. Um, one of the things we see in tunnels is the use of very intensive cultivation. So you can see tomatoes and lettuce. Uh, in this particular situation, this grower would harvest that lettuce about the time the tomatoes are ready to be staked and strung. And so essentially, uh, your lettuce becomes your pathways in between the tomatoes. Um, and here you can see some English cucumbers on the left. These are um, heirloom tomatoes on the right. Uh, this, these are what we call multi-bay high tunnels. So this is actually a two acre high tunnel. Um, now I wouldn't necessarily recommend these for central Kansas. Uh, it gets a little bit windy where you all are compared to where we are. Uh, we do have a half acre multi-bay high tunnel at the research station, but um, most growers in Kansas are, are gonna be using four season tunnels. Um, which are able to support a, a snow load and in general are more tolerant to the wind. 
these are what we call caterpillar high tunnels and you can buy kits or you can build them yourselves in this case we actually made these high tunnels um, from fencing essentially these are top rails of chain link fencing that we bent into hoops and then you can just make the high tunnel as long or as short as you want um, this is the kit version of that so these come from farmers friends and it's uh, essentially the same thing uh, but you can buy those hoops pre-bent um, and those can be really handy. One of the nice things about these um, caterpillar tunnels is they can also be moved fairly easily. So, you know, most growers won't move them every year, but you can move them every two or three years, which can help increase your crop rotation intervals. Uh, this is what we call a, a gothic tunnel. So tunnels that are pointed at the top are gonna shed snow a little bit better. Um, and that can be useful in general. They're usually stronger as well, the ones that are um, a little bit uh, that gothic shape. These are some of our high tunnels at the research station. You can see uh, spinach is a crop that loves to grow in high tunnels in Kansas. And I just really enjoy this picture because you can see all this snow piled up around the high tunnel. I think this picture was probably taken in January or February. Um, and, you know, the lettuce is just loving it. In fact, we had to uncover them because it was so warm in the tunnel. So we've collected data, you know, that basically shows some of the differences in the microclimate. And, you know, again, we won't go into all the details of that today, but, you know, again, just this idea that those tunnels are gonna protect those crops from um, those difficult storms, but also provide some thermal protection uh, early in the spring as well. Uh, this is kind of a cool piece of data. So this is some work we did back in 2014 and 15, where we were growing tomatoes, both in the high tunnel and the open field. Um, and one of the things that we see, and this is this is pretty consistent, not just in this data, but other work that we do, um, is that the high tunnel has a much higher minimum. So you can have bad years in the open field and it really devastates your profitability. If you look over here in 2015, um, you know, they just, we just had miserable yields in the open field. Whereas in the high tunnel, even in bad years, you're still going to get a decent crop. And so, you know, that's one of the things that I think a lot of growers appreciate about growing in tunnels is they just give you a little bit more production stability. So just to kind of wrap things up, you know, again, um, you it's impossible to overestimate the market demand for local fruit and vegetables right now. And this is true in cities and urban areas, everything in between, um, sorry, in rural areas and everything in between. Um, that market is just really driven by this consumer need for fresh vegetables and supporting local agriculture. And so, you know, this is a nice opportunity um, to, to, to take advantage of that. Um, and, but there are challenges. Growing in Kansas is difficult. There's a, a weather. We do have good soil and we have access to water. And those are two things to, to not forget about. Um, but, you know, you are going to have some issues related to environment. So, you know, I always recommend to growers to think about protected cultivation, high tunnels, greenhouses. Um, that doesn't mean it has to be your entire farm, but it needs to be a part of it so that you have a little bit more uh, stability uh, in case there are bad years. And there's, you know, lots of opportunity for scaling up into the wholesale market. Now that takes a whole, that has a whole nother set of challenges that go along with it in terms of production and increasing that efficiency. Um, but if you have an interest in doing that, there's a lot of good support in the area. Uh, and we have some, some programs to help support uh, wholesale growers as well, too. So with that, I think we're about out of time. Um, and, you know, I'd be happy to take any questions. All right. We have a question in the chat. Um, wanting to confirm <clears throat> that the benefit of the plastic on the sweet potato beds that pulled up after a few days is to kill weeds and pests. Uh, was that the benefit? And also, um, that's a lot of plastic after using it once, maybe twice. Um, that's just a waste product and that's a question there. So they're wondering about the use of plastic and, um, and the, the benefits of the plastic. Right, so the, the main benefit is, is the weed management part. And the idea with the, the sweet potatoes, there's been a lot of research lately with this idea that we call stale seed bedding systems, where rather than trying to prevent weeds from germinating, 
the idea is we want to promote them to germinate and kill them <laughs> before we actually plant our crops. So typically this is done with um, cultivation, um, and which, which can be really hard on the soil. In this particular example, um, the idea is basically that you would have the plastic on and when those beds get wet, uh, it's gonna stimulate those weeds to germinate. They're gonna hit the plastic and they're, and they're gonna die, right? And so um, by the time you plant those sweet potatoes, you don't have to disturb the soil at all. Um, the flush of weeds has come out and has been killed by the plastic. And so you have a lot lower weed pressure moving forward. Um, now, is it a waste of plastic? I, 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 I'm not sure I'm the person to answer that question for you. I do think one of the things that if I were trying to reapply that system, you know, if you were to grow broccoli or lettuce under that plastic in the spring and then pull the plastic, you know, in, after you're done with that crop, you could plant sweet potatoes in there and basically use the same premise uh, to manage those weeds. So, you know, I think there's ways you can, you know, be creative to think about, you know, getting more crops out of that particular sheet of plastic. Because um, I understand it seems kind of weird to put down plastic and then just pull it back up three weeks later. Um, but, you know, there's lots of different ways you can do that. And in terms of, uh, at the end of the day, there being a lot of plastic, I, I totally understand, you know, one of the things we're trying to do is reduce reduce the use of petroleum-based products in agriculture, um, but also increase the efficiency of the petroleum products, based products that we're using so that we're getting more crops uh, with less plastic. So, you know, I think the, the use of, and I think high tunnels get criticized in a similar way, but if you, if you think about, you know, how much you're increasing your productivity um, by the use of that plastic, then hopefully it would help offset some of those challenges. Um, but the reality is, is that all you have to do is go to the grocery store to realize that plastic is used everywhere in produce. I mean, from clamshells to produce bags to the grocery bags you go home with, you know, plastic is just like inundated in our food system. So, you know, for, for me, if we have to use a little bit in order to grow those local crops, then, you know, that's, if we're going to use it somewhere, that's maybe not the worst place to use it, put it that way. Okay. The um, question, NRCS is Natural Resource Conservation Service. Right, right, that's exactly right. Yep, and I went through that part pretty fast, but it's the EQIP program that's okay. helped su support high tunnel production. Okay. Um, are there organic or natural methods that you found effective for preventing or combating pests such as squash bugs? Yeah, so managing squash bugs organically, there's a couple different approaches. Um, for most people that are going to grow cucurbits organically, they're going to use row covers. So, you know, with especially with things like cucumbers um, and uh, summer squash, what you can do is is short right after you plant those 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 things, uh, you'll put row cover over, which is basically spun bonded fabric. Um, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to just be a mechanical barrier uh, so that those bugs can't get in. And <clears throat> there's also a lot of research being done in Kentucky and other places where they're using actually insect screening, essentially, uh, to keep those off. And, and that's actually pretty effective. Um, and for smaller scale stuff, it works well. Um, if, you're, if you're buying organic cucumbers at the farmer's market, there's a very high likelihood it was grown under row cover. Um, so using row cover, using netting is I think what most organic growers are doing. Uh, there are folks in other parts of the country where pressure is, is actually worse, believe it or not, than here um, that are using some of the organic approved pesticides uh, like Pyganic. And Pyganic has some efficacy on, on squash bugs. But the challenge with Pyganic is that it loses that efficacy in like an hour, something like that. It breaks down really fast in the environment. And so you basically have to spray it a lot. Okay. Are there any, uh, are there any compostable products being developed for weed, for weed protection? Yeah, so we actually have um, a faculty member in the department, uh, Jeremy Cowan, who's done a bunch of research with biodegradable plastics. 
So that is that is something that's that's doing becoming more popular. It isn't as popular yet in the commercial world, um, but there's been a lot of research on it in the last 10 to 15 years. Um, and they're and they are plastics made from corn starches and, and other bio-based products that can break down into soil. Um, now there are challenges associated with those two in that um, I don't know. There's a lot of conjecture out there amongst the researchers as to what they break down into and, and how good that is for the soil. So, you know, one of the things that I've heard people that, that have worked with biodegradable plastics talk about a lot is you still want to remove that plastic at the end of the spring because, or at the end of the, the growing season, um, because there are potentially microplastics and other things that can end up in that soil that you don't want there. However, in any, no, no matter if you're using biodegradable plastic or the standard ones, it's impossible to get 100% of the plastic out of that field, right? And so if you're using those biodegradable plastics, you should still remove as much as you can, but understand that if you leave some behind, maybe it's, it's not as bad for the environment as the other ones.